in Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Dr. Kim Yu, and I'm excited to be here today. Um, I am the convener for the special interest group in health equity for Wonka. And I am joined here by multiple of our young doctor movement leads um, and excited to share with you health equity around the world. And Dr. Sankar Randene Kumara is here to give an introduction, and uh, Dr. Zainab Mohammed um, is also here, as, as well as several others. And so I wanted to share a little bit about our special interest group on health equity. Um, our special interest group really focuses in on providing support, education, and really thinking about what are the things we need to do to be able to bring health equity to our nations, to our countries, and how can we share information that will be important for us to be able to move the needle. We have done lots of work when it comes to health equity, as you can see in the following slide. Um, if we move forward, one slide, um, including health equity trainings, implicit bias trainings, and have done collaborations with WHO digital media teams and others when it came to COVID vaccinations and misinformation about the COVID pandemic. Um, we are working on a series of health equity cross nations lectures that we have been doing at previous Wonka meetings and looking at health equity impact assessments, which you'll hear about later today as well. Um, you can see some future plans there and lots of us will meet at the Wonka World Meeting in Sydney and also in Wonka Europe and other um, regional Wonka meetings. And so I'm looking forward to meeting you there at those meetings and also um, several others who are very active on our Wonka SIG, including Dr. Viviana Martinez Bianchi and um, Joy Mugambi from Africa and others that you saw in the photographs previously. Um, I'm going to pass this time on now to our Wonka YDM leads. Dr. Zena, would you like to take over? Thank you, uh, thank you, Kim. Um, so, thank for the thank you for the wonderful introduction, and thank you also for collaborating with the Spice Root uh, for this webinar. So, I'm sure we're gonna learn a lot from you regarding health equity and all the presentations that will come forward um, in the uh, webinar today. So, yes, I am the Wonka uh, Spice Root Chair. Um, for uh, South Asia region. So this is just a small introduction of what Spice Root is all about. So these are kind of kept flags and a picture of flags that all the countries that are involved in, um, uh, in, in our region, uh, which are a part of Spice Root, um, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, Nepal, India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. Uh, prob uh, so these are the active members uh, of the Spice Root movement. And we have, um, so this is a small picture that I've kept uh, showing how we conduct our regular meetings every month. Uh, it's on the second Sunday of each month where we keep our regular meetings and discuss the ongoing activities that you want to do in the Spice Root movement. Um, so we have, yes, we have Dr. Gobel, Dr. Serin, Dr. Asita, myself, Dr. Gunjan, and Dr. Rohain. So we have a couple of people who also would be a part of the webinar today also and who always um, work proactively uh, for the Spice Root movement. Uh, moving ahead, I have a I have just shown picture of a couple of activities that we do um, nearly every on regularly on every monthly or quarterly basis, which involves a regular CPD activities, which have been done by all the con various countries of the Spice Group, as I mentioned. So a couple of activities are done by India, which so they conduct classroom sessions every uh, monthly. So we have lounge sessions by the Spice Group Team Pakistan. So we try to conduct CPD activities. Uh, with that, uh, with the young doctors, and then we have GP's cafe from the Sri Lanka, Sri Lankan side. So uh, to um, uh, for the young doctors. Uh, also, we have physical FM three hundred and sixty exchanges, and a couple of these exchanges had been done previously uh, before COVID, but after COVID, the uh, physical exchanges were gotten limited. So at that time, we tried and arranged the virtual FM three hundred and sixty exchange programs. And then we did a one with the European Young Doctors Movement, and there was one we did with the Rajkumar Movement. So that was one um, 
uh, one good experience where we try to explain uh, explain oh, virtually how the family medicine or uh, how a GP practice is done um, in other regions. So uh, those are those are one of our uh, some of our ongoing activities. Um, we try to organize regular webinars um, uh, uh, in collaboration with um, other um, SIGs and stuff. And along with that, we try to collaborate webinars with uh, on important days, like for example, diabetes. Um, cancer Days, World Diabetes Day. There was one uh, which was conducted uh, previously um, last month by the Spice Root Movement Sri Lanka, which was hosted by the Spice Root Movement Sri Lanka, but it was a regional webinar on the World Safety Day for Health at Work. So um, that was one um, a good session that all of us had attended. Uh, also, we provide scholarships for the young doctors in order to attend Wonka conferences because that's one thing that we believe that it's one platform which unites us all as well as it gives us great opportunities to um, uh, to meet so young doctors to uh, meet new people and meet young doctors from other regions and other countries. So um, that's a one a good experience for them. So we arrange try and arrange scholarships scholarships for them. Also, um, we uh, have a Spice Root Star Award. So the the the, the uh, the winner of the Spice Suit Star Award then goes on ahead to um, uh, as a nomination for the Wonka World Rising Star Award. So these are a couple of ongoing activities, um, and and that's about it. Thank you so much uh, for um, letting me speak for a couple of minutes. So hopefully um, there'll be a pleasant experience ahead, and uh, hope the webinar goes up really well. Thank you. So I think um, it would be Dr. Naseem, Naseem. over to Naseem for uh, introduction of Dr. Nicholson. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Zainab. Can you all hear me? Uh, yes. Okay. So I'm Dr. Naseem uh, hosting the uh, webinar today uh, with Dr. Kim Yu. Uh, I belong to Islamabad, Pakistan. I'm working as a family medicine uh, consultant here. Uh, so welcome you all on board. Um, just to, uh, I would like to now begin the uh, formally the program with um, starting with Dr. Nicholson's uh, presentation. Uh, Dr. Nicholson is a family medicine specialist at the Anika Health Clinic Lang under the Malaysian Ministry of Health. She is a fellow of the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners and a member of the Academy of Family Physicians Malaysia. She has been serving in primary care for the last seven years. Uh, welcome on board, Dr. Nicholson, uh, with your um, uh, presentation. Thank you, Nasi. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us here today. I'm Marina Anthony Nicholson, a family medicine specialist from Malaysia. So today I'll be speaking on the importance of community engagement in promoting health equity. Next slide, please. Here is the outline of my talk. Firstly, I'll paint the picture by defining some common terms. And then I'll speak about the importance of community engagement in promoting health equity, the heart of this talk. And finally, I'll share some examples of community engagement. Next slide, please. So let's start with the first part. What is health? Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well being, and not merely the absence of disease. What then are health disparities? Health disparities are preventable differences. The key word here is preventable. In health outcomes experienced by specific population groups, these outcomes may be measured by indicators such as disease prevalence and mortality rate. These preventable differences may be caused by social factors such as unemployment, education status, and housing. So these non medical social factors that influence health outcomes are termed social determinants of health. Next slide, please. When these factors cause unfair outcomes in people's health, it's called health inequity. Health equity, on the other hand, is what we aim to achieve when everyone has the opportunity to be as healthy as possible. Next slide, please. Here's how these terms are related. Social determinants of health, which are the conditions in which people live, work, and play, lead to health disparities, 
preventable differences in health outcomes, which in turn may result in health inequities, where one group is unfairly disadvantaged as compared to another. Okay, next slide, please. Here's my favorite slide. This picture shows how health equality is not the same as health equity. Health equality, as seen in the upper portion of the picture, is providing everyone with the same bicycle without considering their ability. A grown man, a teenage girl, a child, and a differently able person are all given the same given bicycle. The same bicycle. Equal distribution of resources does not produce equal outcomes. Some people just need more than others to achieve the same level of health. In the lower portion of the picture, that picture explains health equity. As we can see, each rider is provided with a bike that matches their sizes and abilities. When provided with specialized bikes that were tailored to their needs, everyone was able to achieve the same outcome. Next slide, please. So then, how do we make health equity a reality? Having painted the picture, let's move on to the second section, the role of community engagement in achieving health equity. There are three critical practices identified to advance health equity. Strengthening the capacity of communities are among the three. Next slide, please. Health equity is a complex problem, and it may seem like we need complex solutions to solve the problem. Yes, However, yes. in reality, the answer lies simply by utilizing existing resources. What then are these existing resources, and how do we utilize them? Number one, by strengthening our existing primary healthcare platform, and number two, by engaging the community to bridge the gap between healthcare systems and the people. Next slide, please. To engage a community, we have to engage the stakeholders. So who are the stakeholders? The stakeholders include political leaders, healthcare workers, religious leaders, and many others. No man is an island. Everyone is part of a community. We too are all part of a community, and hence, every single person here may play their part in promoting health equity. Next slide, please. So now that we have an idea of who our stakeholders are, what are the advantages of engaging them? The three main advantages are, number one, because community members know their community at its core, it enables changes within the community that can lead to health equity. Number two, it works towards building health systems that are sustainable and efficient. And lastly, community engagement promotes involvement of the community in public health programs. Next slide, please. Having identified the stakeholders and benefits of community engagement, how do we do this practically? So there are four main approaches, each with increasing levels of community engagement. Number one, community-oriented. Number two, community-based. Number three, community-managed. Number four, community-owned. As the level of engagement deepens, the leadership, knowledge, and skills of these community members increases. So let's explore each approach further. The first approach is community-oriented. Here, the community is informed and mobilized to participate in a concern with strong external support. Next slide, please. The COVID-19 COVID vaccination program, which in many countries required community participation to curb the pandemic, is perhaps the starkest example of community-oriented approach. Another example, in Malaysia, we have the National Health Screening Initiative. It's run by the government countrywide and is aimed at screening those above the ages of 18 for non-communicable diseases. It's often done as an outreach program at parks, shopping malls, and factories with resources supplied by the government. I'm sure most of us here have our own relatable examples in our own country. Community-oriented is a very common approach, and many public health engagement efforts are focused at this level. The second type of engagement, community-based. 
This is a deeper level of engagement. In this approach, the community's concerns are heard and they are consulted and involved in decision making. Interventions too come from within the community. Here, external support is minimal. Some examples of community-based approaches in my country are the community's views are heard when locating health clinics, having pamphlets available in local languages, and engaging translators at healthcare facilities when dealing with patients who do not speak the same language. Also, most of our primary health clinics have an advisory panel which consists of community leaders elected from the local area. Regular meetings are conducted between health clinics and these leaders to listen to our community's goals. Many health promotional activities such as cancer screening programs are also organized by these advisors and they are held within our communities with support from the government. Often, these leaders are also recruited to help address misinformation and myths among the communities. This is useful because these leaders know their community best and are trusted by them. The third approach is community managed, where there is collaboration from the leaders of the community and decision comes from the people itself. In this approach, there's a higher level of engagement from the community as compared to the previous two. <laughs> issues concerning this approach are issues concerning prerequisites for health, such as lack of housing, water sanitation, and unemployment. Here, the community comes together, prioritizes issues affecting them, and comes up with solutions. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Thank you. The fourth approach, community owned, is when community assets are fully mobilized and the community is empowered to develop their own systems and sustainable mechanisms for health promotion. Here, external support is only part of the network. Problems that can be addressed using this approach include next slide. Please environmental degradation, climate change, and poverty. For example, the community is involved in the law or policy making process. Community owned is the highest level of community engagement. So to summarize, there are four main approaches to community engagement, each varying in the level of community involvement. Nevertheless, it is important to remember that different problems require different approaches. So having set out the what, the why, the who's and the how's of community engagement, in conclusion, communities have the power to help their members achieve health equity and they should be empowered to do so. More power to them. I'll end my talk here. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nicholson. And we are excited to have our next presenter, Dr. Hanin Musa, Tahir Musa, um, who is a family physician at the Jordanian Ministry of Health and is the Al Razi representative of a Jordan team. Um, she's a trainer for healthcare providers on intimate partner violence, a clinical supervisor of educational programs for family medicine residents and actively involved in awareness campaigns. Thank you, Dr. Musa. Thank you, Kim, for this nice introduction. Uh, and thank, uh, thanks to the Spice Root Movement and Wonka YDM to organize this webinar. Uh, I will talk about the role of technology in promoting health equity. And as we are addressing the uh, equal access to healthcare services in improving the health outcomes and having better quality of life, it's important to uh, talk about how does technology promote health equity. Next slide, please. Next slide. First, by expanding care access and reducing the length of stay. So virtual visits actually, uh, they address the time and transportation costs and uh, follow up the patients through the uh, care journey, uh, not only expands the care, but also 
but also opens up more beds to uh, uh, opens up more beds for patients in need in critical care. And actually, uh, when the patient's primary healthcare <coughs> provider <coughs> connect with the specialists virtually, uh, it will provide immediate diagnosis and a treatment plan rather than referral that might delay the treatment. Next slide. Next slide, please. Promoting patients to report social determinant. No, 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 the previous one, please. Promoting patients to report social determinants of health, like food insecurity or health care access barriers that care team is empowered to intervene when needed. This study, for example, concluded that text messaging is an efficient way to communicate with patients during the COVID-19 pandemic. And it also applies even after the end of the uh, uh, pandemic. So communication with patients uh, through technology provides emotional support through encouragement, detect transportation or child care issues that impede in-person visits, assist access to food, identify medication and adherence due to cost issues, and provide education about diseases with short videos and graphics. Next slide. Enhancing patient engagement. Actually, according to the CDC, growing number of evidences shows that more engaged a patient, more likely to have better outcome. So digital health increased the engagement by providing better understanding of the patient's health condition and avoid confusion in the care plan. And when designing the digital health tools, many issues should be considered, like the patient-centric design. So the digital health tool should be flexible, consistent, and user-friendly. Omni channel strategy, digital health tool should provide many options to respect to patients' preferences. So we find patients prefer email, emailing, others prefer uh, to be engaged in social media. Multilingual and cultural adaptation, and this is important actually for co companies, global companies operating across different regions. So high quality translation should be provided to improve the health literacy and increase the access. Diversity, equity and inclusion like text size, font, colors, ease of use, guidelines like the website uh, access uh, uh, guidelines which uh, actually uh, should be available to all, regardless of ethnicity and disability. Next slide. Um, I guess there's one before uh, about capturing more accurate data to uh, provide more targeted personalized care solutions instead of general information. Uh, next slide. Uh, experts agree about many of technology benefits, but uh, as well as there are some challenges have been identified and we need to be to deal with it specifically, like the additional costs for families, building trust between patients and healthcare providers, accuracy of the information published. Next. The increasing complexities and uncertainties of both digital technologies and health make the landscape of digital health uncharted territory in terms of research. So digital health, it's a new research area and we need systematic approach, systematic research to understand, to have better understanding of the effectiveness of digital health in improving health equity. Next. Many journals actually provide the platforms to public research, to publish research in the field of digital health. And they also provide an open access to content to all stakeholders responsible in the digital healthcare, like Frontiers in Digital Health. Next, please. <clears throat> Next. Uh, like Frontier in Digital Health and Lancet Digital Health. Uh, briefly, I will talk about uh, digital health tools in my country, Jordan. Previous slide, please. Uh, we have many digital health tools in uh, my country. Uh, first of them, 
uh, Hakim, which has been launched at 2009. It's a computerized uh, record system for patients through which uh, the primary healthcare physicians can navigate lab results, imaging notes of the patients without uh, missing any data. So we can stay on the track with our patients. And uh, uh, the patients can set an appointments through many sites, one of them Hakim, another one called Atubi. Uh, another uh, program called HDA or Huda, through which patients can uh, review the lab results and have interpretation so they have better insights about their disease. And uh, patients with a chronic disease, they can receive their monthly medication uh, by ordering them on Hakim, and so they receive it wh wherever they are. Finally, as technology and telehealth continue to grow and advance, it's important to ensure that no one is left behind. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much, um, I would like, uh, I would now like to invite Dr. Gabriela Pesencia for her next talk. Uh, she is a family medicine practitioner, currently a postdoctoral fellow with the National Clini Clinician Scholars Program and Clinical Associate Faculty at U Department of Family Medicine and Community Health. She has a master's in applied science in population health management and has used this training to lead community engaged research to map systems, their assets, and evaluate the impact they have on improving community level outcomes. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we welcome you, uh, Dr. Kipraida. Hi, everyone. I'm happy to be here, um, and I'll be presenting on social determinants of health. I'm just waiting for my slide to appear. Yes, there it is. Thank you so much. Um, as Nassim said, I am Gabriela Placencia, family medicine doctor in the United States, and also a postdoctoral health equity um, research fellow um, here at Duke University. Next slide. Um, so similar to what some of our other uh, presenters have done, I just wanna set the stage with some terminology. Um, especially here in the United States, we've had an evolution of the terminology that we currently use. And so I just wanna share how we currently talk about social determinants um, of health. Social determinants of health is the more traditional term that has been used, it's been defined by the W. HO um, as the conditions in which we live, work, grow, and the outer structures like systems and policies that affect that. Um, and so the issue with this terminology is that determinants is a very fatalistic um, term, meaning that individuals have little power in changing what happens in their future because these social factors are determining what happens in their future. Um, and therefore there's been this change to discussing more social drivers of health rather than determinants of health meaning that these drivers can influence or impact their health outcomes, but there are things that individuals can do to change that. Um, however, social determinants or social drivers um, are not positive or negative inherently. Some people are born into conditions where they work, live, grow that are positive. Um, and therefore talking about social risk factors truly identifies which ones of those factors are negative or can have negative impact on their health. Um, and finally, not all social risk factors translate to immediate social needs. Um, and so social needs are what people need in the moment to improve their health. For example, if they have housing insecurity, food insecurity, um, those might be things they need immediately. Whereas, you know, if they're having pay, ha trouble paying with their utilities or transportation, but they have someone who's helping with that right now, they may, that might not be a social need in the moment. Next slide. Um, so social risk factors, just to go through them, um, I think many of you could think of these examples in your own countries. Um, so I just want to describe how this played out during the pandemic here in Durham, North Carolina, especially in the Latinx population here. Um, so for example, transportation. A lot of the uh, Latino, Latine, Latinx community here in North Carolina was essential workers. We have a lot of people working in factories and agriculture in restaurants. Um, and so people relied on public transportation. And during the pandemic, public transportation had less routes. Um, and also, you know, the people using it for the most part were essential workers that also had limited access to protective equipment, masks, et cetera. Um, and so it was just a higher risk situation for everyone. Access to food in the United States, there weren't um, national programs to help people get food to their homes. And so if someone tested positive for COVID, 
Um, either they had to break their quarantine to go get food at the grocery store or stay home with limited amount of food. Um, and housing insecurity in the United States, the price of housing has gone up 75%, um, whereas the uh, average uh, salary for an individual has gone up about 50% with inflation. Therefore, um, the salary hasn't caught up to the uh, rise in housing prices, um, and therefore housing insecurity is at its highest um, that it's ever been. Um, and so this is something that has been an issue during the pandemic, post the pandemic, um, and especially for marginalized minoritized populations, um, access to housing, housing loans um, and opportunities have been reduced. Um, and then other things that were brought up during the pandemic are um, things such as access to healthcare. Um, so in the United States, we don't have um, a global healthcare system um, and therefore uh, insurance, access to insurance is not guaranteed for everyone. Um, and a lot of people, um, a lot of people, for example, have high deductibles, co-pays, et cetera, um, or just have general distrust of the healthcare institutions because of bad experiences they've had either due to racism, discrimination um, in the institutions. Um, and another access that, another access issue that came up was language equity. And by language equity, I mean um, having interpreters, having you know, interpretive services, whether through an iPad, a phone, et cetera, um, for people who do not speak English. And especially during the pandemic, as many of you can remember, there were limited amounts of people allowed in the room, sometimes none, just the patient. Um, now the patient can communicate for themselves or advocate for themselves and are relying on a system that doesn't have uh, good interpreter services um, in the moment. And therefore they are completely isolated and removed from their families in that moment, um, leading to a lot of um, trauma for these families um, and uh, bringing back issues of desaparecidos or disappeared family members, which is something that has happened historically um, for Latino communities um, in their home countries for a long time. Next slide. Um, the historical context is very important, and this is something that is likely not unique for the United States, but especially in the United States is important because the countries that people immigrated from and the areas of the United States that they immigrated to and the laws in those areas um, have a high impact on poverty rates and wealth inequality over generations. And I can share a personal story about how um, this happens. So around 10 years ago, not too long ago, I was applying for medical school and looking for housing for myself. Um, I, my husband and I worked with a real estate agent and she took us, she picked us up at the hotel and took us, um, to some of the properties. And as she was taking us to these properties, she said, um, you know, I'll let you, I'll tell you this because your husband is white. Um, but traditionally in real estate, you'll see that we don't put up signs, um, for sale or for rent because we want to make sure that only the right kind of people are, are having access to these, these homes in nicer areas. Um, and I was a little taken aback by that and asked, what do you mean? Um, and she said, well, we want to make sure that um, we keep the neighborhood safe and protected from people who don't belong here. And so we only put up signs. Uh, we don't put up any signs. You have to contact a real estate agent um, to be able to know where these properties are. Um, and so I was shocked um, by this very clearly dis discriminatory practice. And so was my husband, who is Cuban-American and therefore is lighter skinned, appears white. Um, but this woman thought that she could say this because my husband, quote unquote, looked white. Um, so that's an example of how opportunities for housing um, and being in a safe neighborhood and being in a neighborhood with good um, you know, local schooling, for example, um, is limited to people that have different skin tones or different backgrounds. Next slide. This is an example of a paper showing how the, the historical context is important. Um, and so uh, Rachel Hardiman and Tyson Brown are some of the leaders in this research um, in the United States. And um, this is a paper describing um, ways to improve measurement of racism um, in the United States. And at the bottom, you can see um, that they mention historical context and geographical context specifically. Um, and if you click one more time, there's another paper that will pop up. There you go. Um, so this is a paper actually measuring whether health outcomes are different based on um, spatial and historical racial context. Um, and so they found that, yes, there is a direct um, association between the area that people immigrated to and the racial context in that area, the history of racial, uh, racial inequality in that area and how that um, predicts uh, future health outcomes. Next slide. Um, and so 
it's important to think about racism, especially in the United States, and there's different forms of racism, but racism is one of the major factors that can contribute to health equity. Um, and so when we talk about racism, I think sometimes there's a little bit of confusion about the different types of racism. Um, one is structural racism, which is the laws, policies, um, and systems that are put in place that affect uh, uh, marginalized, minoritized communities differently. Um, institutionalized racism is racism that is more specific to an organization. For example, if your workplace has laws um, that affect, uh, you know, people based on their race, ethnicity differently, um, that that's a form of institutionalized racism. Um, and then interpersonal racism is what people typically think about um, when they think about racism. Um, so that is, you know, one person's con uh, conscious or subconscious bias affecting the way they interact with others. And then there's internalized racism. You know, when you've been uh, in, a, in a system or a society that constantly says that people like you, that look like you, and from your background are not as worthy or as um, of value as others, then you start to internalize that into your own beliefs about yourself and your family and what you're capable of doing, which then um, leads to further negative outcomes. Next slide. So this is important because it has impact not just on the person experiencing it, but also for generations later. Um, and so I just want to show two quick examples of how this can have multi-generational impact. Um, number one is a lot of studies in the United States and likely outside of the United States have shown that parents who were exposed to a high number of ACEs or adverse childhood events when they were children um, will um, likely have children who experience high level of ACEs of their own. Um, and so these ACEs um, or adverse childhood events, it, it include things like abuse or neglect um, as children, younger single parents, or living in um, communities with high crime rates. Um, and so this is important because you, you would hope that just because one individual experienced it, that that would be the end of that cycle, but uh, isn't necessarily. Um, high level of ACEs in parents often predicts level of ACEs in children. Um, and this is one mechanism by which uh, mental health and substance use disorders are more prevalent in populations that have higher social risk factors. Next slide. Another example of how um, uh, racism and, um, and social risk factors can have multi-generational generational impact on health is epigenetic changes. So epigenetics is changes in methylation, or um, other aspects of the DNA um, that occur in, in response to stress and other external factors. Um, and these epigenetic changes can be passed down, um, inherited in, through genetics. And so um, you can see on this image on the right that, for example, if a mother experiences a lot of stress while she's pregnant, um, those DNA changes are passed on to the infant. Um, it can affect uh, the metabolism of that individual um, that individual um, then has higher levels of cortisol, insulin, um, and higher blood pressure. Um, and then that can be perpetuated to the next generation. And each of those individuals are then experiencing their own stress, right? Um, and so in the United States, um, most individuals are told to report their race and ethnicity. Um, so by race, uh, it usually means uh, white, black, um, Asian, et cetera. And ethnicity means Hispanic, not Hispanic. Um, and so in the United States, if you're, at, if you're looking at Hispanic individuals or Latino Latinx individuals, um, uh, there's been evidence to show that individuals that are of Latino Hispanic descent that um, self-identify as other or black as their race have worse outcomes than individuals of Latino Hispanic descent that consider themselves white. Um, and so a lot of this might be racialization externally based on skin tone um, and appearance um, and how that impacts the stress experienced um, by these individuals um, and therefore affecting health outcomes longer term. Next slide. One before you, thank you. Um, so what are we doing about this? So at least in the United States um, and like many other countries, we're trying to record and track um, social risk factors using ICD-10 codes. Um, in the United States, traditionally in the healthcare system, um, there wasn't much focus on social risk factors. And so now a lot of healthcare systems are uh, trying to invest more in social workers, case managers, and there's an increased interest in community health workers, something that many other countries have had for a long time and shown has great um, outcomes in the United States that hasn't really been invested in. So now there's a little bit more interest in that. Um, and then increased engagement with community-based organizations. Again, other countries have been doing this 
um, for a long time in the United States. Um, social and community benefits have always been very separate from the healthcare system. And now there's a growing realization that that is inefficient and ineffective. Um, and so healthcare systems are trying to collaborate with um, community-based organizations more. Um, and then insurance is starting um, to think about ways to reimburse for addressing root causes of disease. Um, and so there's conversation about whether insurance is really the right way to promote this. But um, in the United States, insurance really dictates, right? Payment really dictates what happens. Um, and therefore, if insurance can reimburse you know, hospital systems for investing in sidewalks um, or parks in neighborhoods to increase physical activity and prevent diabetes, um, then that saves the insurance company money and, and uh, saves the hospital system money and uh, prevents worse health outcomes um, for uh, communities that experience social risk factors. Um, so that's another potential way of addressing this. Um, and I think that's the end of my presentation. Next slide. Um, the last slide just had my email address, so feel free to email me and also be in one of the breakout rooms um, if you want to talk about this more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Placencia, and we're so uh, happy now to have our next speaker and um, Dr. Gobeth um, from Sri Lanka, and so we'll wait for our slides here. Dr. Gobeth is a family physician and visiting lecturer at the Department of Community and Family Medicine at the University of Jaffna in Sri Lanka. He's the in-charge physician at the NCD and Healthy Lifestyle Department at the District General Hospital in Negombo in Sri Lanka and serves as an executive council member of the Wonka Working Party on Rural Practice and um, also is the national chair of the Young Doctors Movement um, and uh, is involved in the spice fruit movement as well for Sri Lanka. Dr. Gobet. Uh, thank you for the opportunity and uh, good evening, good afternoon, morning, everyone. Uh, may I audible? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, so, here are the challenges faced by the low middle income countries. That's why I'm going to talk for the coming 10 minutes. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, actually, I'm going not talking to about the health uh, definition, but still, uh, we will talk about the health is a fundamental right. We still, the half of the population are not receiving the adequate or essential health care services. Likewise, this is a health equity. So we are, everyone uh, given the definition, but still, we have seen a lot of disparities are there in the among the region or in the race or whatever that. So uh, going for the next slide, please. Next slide, please. You want to this next this one? This, this next. One? Yeah, this this one, yes. Okay. Yeah, uh, from this topic, actually, the previous one. Yeah. So from the talks, I'm going to talk about some of the disparities in the health and healthcare among the low middle countries. I'll talk about the socioeconomic status and poverty, population and aging, disease burden, and health spending, and healthcare system supporting and health information and data. So we will see one by one. So please go for the next slide, please. Yeah, actually, this uh, Dr. Habike has talked about much about the health disparity and uh, driven by the social and economic inequality. Even though, so I just uh, give the some overview, like uh, so, this disparity not only direct to the health, but there's a lot of other parameters that come on that. So, economic stability, neighborhood and physical environment, education, food, food security, and uh, community and safety, social context, and mainly about the healthcare system, maybe about the uh, that health average and all. Please go for the next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah, the poverty is a major factor in determining the accessibility and the quality of the healthcare. Uh, yeah, poverty and low income status are associated with the various healthcare outcomes, including sort of life expectancy, uh, higher infant mortality rate, and material mortality rate. You may have seen the, the graph like the natural poverty line versus uh, GDP has uh, charted here. So all the bottom line, the most of the 
low middle income countries are uh, spotted. Please go for the next slide. Yeah, so second uh, reason may be the uh, population and aging. You may see the from the first graph, so the from poorest nation have the more younger population than for the population uh, region. They are where they have uh, the may mainly with the elderly population. So in the meantime, so if we have the, this primate like, so but population and aging in the uh, in the low middle countries are going as a democratic shift in the three times of very fast in going and the primate are shifting from this. Uh, the uh, picture to the elderly population as well. With the background, you may have seen the other picture from the uh, uh, population of how the age population is having the death and disability among the other region. So even for the decades, so it's still same as the higher death and disability rate in the low middle income countries. Go to the next slide, please. Next, uh, yeah. So this is the main one uh, for the low middle income country. We may talk about that. This is burden. Actually, the combination of both uh, demographic and epidemiological changes are producing rapid shift in the disease profile in the many uh, low middle income countries. Especially this uh, transition go from the burden from communicable to non communicable disease. So we will see some examples from the next slide. Uh, this is the same picture I have shown previously. So from this uh, given uh, the, the multiple uh, reasons, so maybe the uh, the causative agent, so that everything converted, maybe social economic status, uh, low you know, the housing, lack of housing facilities, water sanitation, food security, and uh, health coverage, poor underdeveloped uh, public health services, everything contributed to the, to the <clears throat> Uh, more in, in, in infectious disease and malnutrition in the most of the poorest nations. So please go for the next slide. Yeah, while I talk about the infectious diseases, the communicable diseases, now the pattern is shifting to non-communicable diseases, like even with the, uh, in addition, we can say assess, uh, assessing the healthy option, uh, health literacy, uh, demography, aging population, and a lot of uh, causative has, uh, uh, to pack on to the shift to the from the communicable to non communicable diseases in the uh, disease burden. Please go for that. Yeah, this is a graph that we can see from this uh, the, uh, the given uh, reference. So you can see porous nation have the more infectious diseases compared to the high nation. Even from that, we can see even the other non communicable diseases also how these charted in the picture. Please go for the next one. This one again with a double burden, so like that from the pediatric population and the, uh, the geriatric population has shown the both effect on the infectious diseases are more in the red color. You may see like a blue color is even moving towards to the uh, the uh, the elderly of the age population. So if we compare from the poorest nation to the higher nation, you, you can clearly see how the infectious diseases and the both even the non-communicable diseases and uh, carcinomas are how the, uh, the prevalence are in the different setup in like this. Okay, please go with that. Next slide. Yeah, uh, that did that. So we, we already talked about the poor social economy status and the health expenditure and the disease burden. Even though that the government health spending for the remaining low in the poor nations. So you may know that the average spending for the health in the low medium countries around $23 uh, dollars per person per annum. Likewise, in the U.S. government, maybe that it's a 2,000 figure, 3,860 per person. Likewise, the U.K. government spent uh, 2,695 per person. So, did like that. So, already there are uh, issues they are related assesses to the preventable and primary care. So, in the poorest nations or the low income countries, it's developed the uh, delayed diagnosis and treatment wise. So, is a further burden to the older disease uh, disease pattern or in the healthcare burdens. Please go for the next one. Yeah, this is a chart again. So about the how the health expenditure with the GDP. Uh, so average $263 per uh, low middle income countries. 
while the IIC is arguing 5,000 towards a huge disparities about the spending uh, health for that. Please go for the next slide. Again, this is again the last two decades. If you see the chart like that, even though we are trying, even the low middle country trying to put some more effect onto the uh, health financing, but still it's more, it's not yet uh, beyond the five or six percent of the GDP. While the high income countries or middle uh, upper middle country, they are started from the six to now they are going past a bit above the nine or ten nine. So this is the clearly show how this we spending the uh, the low middle countries are spending the. Uh, uh, expertise of the health data uh, um, outcomes. Please go to the next uh, slide. Uh, this is the final one you may know. Everything has to, even the, I have mentioned about the poverty or even the disease burden or whatever the, the financing, but everything has to be done by this health care system. So we should have the proper health care system. Maybe the poorest nations have the, this, especially maybe the, about the uh, the low spending or whatever that, so that they have the very uh, fragmented healthcare or maybe underdeveloped public health system may be having that. It may further burden with this age population and uh, with uh, maybe with the uh, geography pattern and with the exposure of war and trauma or conflict. Maybe everything contributed to the more and more difficult with this the healthcare delivery in this, uh, this low middle income countries. Please go with that next slide. From this now, after now we talk about this, the all the conditions, uh, what we can, what are the causes can be uh, contribute for the disparities. So from that, so WHO has uh, given the, uh, the, uh, the recommendation, how we have to do the building blocks to that. So if we have to consider the service uh, delivery, we have to do even for uh, curative, maybe the uh, primary care or maybe the uh, preventive care services. And workforce, you may talk about the workforce. You uh, be, the developed country may have the one doctor for 520 population, while the developing countries have the one uh, doctor for 15,000 population. So with the huge disparity, it is uh, the looking after the care for the uh, their own population. Likewise, we can talk about the health information system. This is a very huge topic. Uh, you know, uh, I already talked about the disease burden. So this is a, now around we may talk about 90% of the disease burden comes from this is the low middle income country, while the data or the research or the what can put the information to the uh, the world around maybe only 10% from them, as well like the even though the putting the grant or anything like that. So it has mainly talk about a 10 to 9 uh, gap. So actually, I'm going to talk one of the uh, uh, this uh, 10 to 9 cap in the Onga Sydney. So if you are interested, you can join there as well. And uh, and uh, the main import, the essential uh, drugs, actually, WHO listed some of the essential drugs should be available for the all the available, uh, all the population in the world to give the universal coverage, but still we are unable to provide it that in the low middle income country. Health financing, I talk about that. Leadership and governance, actually, this is a very important one because even though uh, even though they are the poorest nation, maybe they have a little uh, on the budget for the health expenditure, but still their policies and should be there to, to cater the even available sources. So that be there. So please go with the next slide. Yeah, so on, the, on top of this, even though we have talked about disparities, are they are low, I have disturbed that, but this is the pandemic show and the more disparities what how how the world is differentiated from the poorest and highest in during the COVID, the pandemic you may know the first picture one of the clinic has uh, wearing you may know the uh, uh, we may not receive the adequate PPV so actually this is the PPV made by the one of the carb uh, the, the bag for the we are used for the garbage so that the yellow bag used as teach as a PP likewise you can see the other side. There's one of the nursing officers using the face shield made by the pet potter. So we are cut down and use it. That's a, how that the, even for the small usage of this um, instrument or equipment has a lack of in the, uh, in the low middle country, especially it has very worse on during the COVID. And uh, we all talk about the vaccine inequity. So you can see actually how the world has purchased the vaccination and that you can see the book and the uh, right hand side. And left hand side, how they actually need the more than 18 
uh, above 18 years of all the population. So how they have pumped all the uh, vaccine to their countries with the wealthy nations. Uh, in the meantime, other uh, poor nations are desperately searching for the vaccine or other medication and all. So this just for the example for that. So the given the example from the beginning, the socioeconomic status and uh, then you know, the disease were a double burden because of this uh, uh, communicable and non-communicable, then the health expenditure, maybe fragmented or underdeveloped healthcare facilities, healthcare system, everything contributed to the, again to the uh, disparities onto the uh, middle-income countries. So please go for the next slide. So with that one, so then the so WHO Commission for also determined on the health development mechanism, how to do this one, with uh, reducing the gap. So they have started from the beginning, the basic, like, so they thought of like, okay, improve the daily living. So without having the proper uh, shelter, food and water, that we can't be uh, giving the health is impossible. So they have to, they should like a uh, living condition be, be improved. And like this, so the distribution power, money and resources should be allocated equally. Uh, maybe I don't know how to do that even from the world, but still it should be there at least do in the fair manner. And also the, the measuring, understanding the problem and assessing the impact the action. So we should first get the information, then only we can go for with that. So this is a background. So we can identify some issues and so we can found so what to do like that. So please go for the next slide. Yeah, this also we talk about. So even though the scores effectively primary care uh, would be a uh, answer for the overcome the disparities in the low middle income settings. I think earlier we had talked about uh, uh, clearly about the community oriented primary care other models. How we uh, you can use it in the low middle uh, low resource setting to overcome these uh, disparities to at least to give us some sort of uh, universal health coverage in the poorest nation. Uh, that's from me. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, this is. Uh, up to now, so if there are any question, we will take in the uh, in the break of two more there. Uh, thank you. Uh, you may contact through this uh, uh, Gobitar to the uh, tutor or whatever that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kobe. Very informative indeed. Uh, I have my. Uh, I would like to welcome Dr. Marina as our last speaker. Uh, Dr. Marina is a family medicine specialist from uh, Bosnia and uh, Herzegovina. She is a national delegate and national exchange coordinator for Bosnia and EYFDM since 2019. She is passionate about health promotion, prevention, lifestyle medicine, women's health, public health, and health inequities. Uh, so thank you very much, Dr. Marina, for joining us today. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good day, and good evening to all of you that is listening now. And I'm going to talk about the impact of racism and discrimination on health outcomes. Next slide. Uh, first of all, let's start with a definition of uh, racism. Uh, and it can be defined as organized system within societies that cause avoidable and unfair inequalities in power resources, capacities, and opportunities across racial or ethnic groups. Uh, it can manifest through beliefs, stereotypes, prejudice, or discrimination. Next slide, please. Uh, the definition of racial discrimination done by International Convention on the Elimination of All Form of Racial Discrimination is any distinction, exclusion, restriction or preference based on race, color, descent or national or ethnic origin, which has the purpose or effect of nullifying or impairing the recognition, enjoyment, and on equal footing of human rights and fundamental freedoms in the political, economical, social, cultural, or any other field of public life. Next one. Next slide. Uh, how can uh, it impact on health? There are several recognized pathways. Uh, first of all, uh, it reduces access to employment, housing, and education, uh, and increases exposure to risk factors. 
it, adver it has adverse cognitive or emotional process and is associated with psychopathology. It also uh, is contaminant with pathopsychological processes. It diminishes participation in healthy behaviors and increases engagement in unhealthy behaviors, either directly as stress coping or indirectly via reduced self-regulation. And also uh, it produces physical injury as a result of racial motivated violence. Next one. Uh, racism is uh, positively associated with poor mental and poor physical health outcomes. Next slide. Uh, what are the health uh, uh, outcomes and the diseases that can be affected? It's cardiovascular diseases, hypertension, diabetes, asthma, obesity, uh, uh, dis uh, immunization, uh, maternal and reproductive health, and also child care. Next one. A healthcare system uh, can uh, be a part of structural racism and discriminatory practices uh, like systemic racism, for example, uh, linked to where services are located or requirement for accessing them also like implicit bias, misinformed clinical practices, discrimination by health professionals. Next slide. Uh, we all know that uh, one of the sustainable development goals is achieving universal health coverage and uh, deleting health inequities that are driven by discrimination. Uh, the people that are uh, of global uh, concern are indigenous people, as people of African descent, Roma, and other ethnic minorities. Health inequities are unjust, preventable, and rem uh, remediable. Uh, next slide. Uh, what are the actions of primary health care in the uh, uh, improving uh, health equities? Uh, it is political commitment and leadership, governance and policy framework, frameworks, engagement of community and other stakeholders, models of care, the primary health care workforce, physical infrastructure, medicines and other health products, purchasing and payment systems, digital uh, technologies for health, uh, system for improving the quality of care, and uh, or researchers, monitoring and evaluation are, uh, one, are the actions that can improve. Uh, next slide. Uh, where is the role of family doctors in uh, deleting racism and the racial discrimination in health outcome? Uh, these are the campaign pillars of this year's uh, Wonka, uh, family, Wonka World Family Doctors Day. And I would uh, like us to focus on community engagement, uh, where we family doctors uh, act as advocates for our patients, uh, for our communities, and work to address systemic barriers to accessing quality health care. Uh, we do it uh, like uh, promotion of health and wellness in the communities through education, outreach, and uh, creating community partnerships. Next slide. Uh, and for the end, uh, before I thank you for the listening, I would just want to quote a man that we all know about, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. that said that our lives begin to end the day, when, uh, the day we become silent about things that matter. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Ivanovich. And we are really excited to um, have all of these wonderful presentations and want to go back to really um, think a little bit through some of the things that have been discussed in some breakout rooms. Before we go to breakout rooms, though, I do want to recognize um, someone very important to our group. Sanka, could you come back on? 
And maybe if we could um, take the slides down so we can see everyone and have Sanka give a few words before we go into breakout rooms, just so everyone knows, we will have the breakout rooms. Um, number one will be in English and Chinese, and um, we will have number three in Spanish. Um, and so for those who require language translation, please go to those rooms. Um, you can join uh, the breakout rooms after Dr. Sanka gives us a little report. Uh, thank you, uh, Kim. <laughs> Actually, I was, I, I was thinking of uh, giving the the vote of thanks, but however, I think it's better here. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you, Kim, and all the sign up. Uh, on behalf of the Wonka Working Party, sorry, Wonka Special Interest Group, soon it will be a working party, uh, Special Interest Group uh, on Health Equity, and uh, also the Spice Root, Wonka Young Doctors Movement uh, uh, of South Asia, for uh, organizing this webinar, YDM webinar, in collaboration with the working parties and the SIG, the number five, uh, on behalf of the Young, young Doctors Movement. And I think uh, health equity is a massive topic, but very, very important topic. And as young doctors who have less discriminations with regard to the regions, um, color, religions, ethnicity, or gender, because we are the people who can lead this, I'm sure. Uh, because we, we are the people least uh, have brainwashed and uh, least discriminations uh, uh, because we, we work together as uh, one uh, whole uh, unit, right? So uh, thank you very much. And uh, we enjoyed the, the, the talks. All five people were very uh, excellent speakers and very informative and covered a vast area within 10 minutes time, each and everyone, I'm very happy. And uh, let's have the discussion going on in the breakout rooms. Uh, and thank you very much and enjoy the day. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sanka. And thank you, everyone else. Thank you for joining us. If you're joining us on Facebook Live and for those who will be catching the recording on YouTube and on Wonka's Facebook page as well later, um, we want to thank you all of our speakers and for those who have attended the meeting we have had over 40 people just so everyone knows uh, join us for this presentation that has spanned many time zones and if you think about the work that we do as family physicians and family doctors throughout the world you are bringing health equity to every single patient and every single community and every single country that you live in. Thank you for the work that you do. And we look forward to seeing you at the next meeting. Yeah, I will create the, uh, the breakout room now. Um, go with the one um, Anna is for uh, it's Anna Sophia for the yeah. uh, Spanish one. Yeah, Anna Sophia. Yeah. And uh, Jerry, yeah, we do it. Jerry has to go to. Yeah, and uh, okay, the first one okay, and third one Capel.
by the government and the um, and the and the money and the amount and these uh, expertise which is dedicated is still you know uh, far less uh, than the actual need uh, although many charity and welfare institutions have been set up some private organizations are already working and they have reached the rural areas now as well uh, like as family medicine has uh, they, we do not have a structured family medicine system uh, yet in our country all over except for a few cities for the main cities only but still, uh, the, the private organizations which are already, uh, uh, they have started working in the rural areas and uh, have established three primary care systems uh, so that uh, the women, uh, so that the women's health and, you know, the public health in general doesn't get compromised. So things are, um, they are, they are putting in effort. We are putting in effort rather, I would say, uh, but still there's a lot to be done. So um, they are just trying to collaborate uh, with the, uh, with the healthcare, uh, with the authority. Uh, of our country, uh, and they are trying to make things possible, uh, particularly uh, with respect to family medicine, because obviously primary healthcare system is the uh, backbone of any healthcare structure. So uh, we are trying to uh, establish that that in our um, in our country. Great. Uh, thank you, Naseem. Uh, thank you uh, for your um, contribution. And now I think it should we go on to group uh, room two. Uh, so room two, I guess Haneen was the um, facilitator there, if I'm not mistaken. I'm not. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hi. Hello. I joined the group. Uh, a little bit late, so I'm okay. point, but I will uh, discuss the points regarding my the lectures I have given about the uh, to equip the digital tools in uh, promoting health equity. Okay. Uh, I think this uh, uh, will make the, uh, the would increase the access to healthcare services, especially in uh, middle and low income countries by uh, providing uh, hot spots to uh, access the care through them. Um, we should uh, provide the families with the uh, tools and a network to uh, make the healthcare services accessible via digital health tools. Um, doctor, um, I would talk about the uh, disparities in healthcare services uh, due to uh, social economic status, and we should work hard on the point by uh, make the insurance coverage more comprehensive. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, Anine. Uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, for your contribution and for your discussion. I'm sure it must have helped the audiences also. Moving on, we have a group, room three. Um, I think in my list, we had uh, Gabriella in room three, so but I'm not sure whether that was the real room three or not. Yes, that was uh, our room. Um, and so we had several questions about the presentations that we discussed, including um, which social risk factor is most important out of the list. And at least in the United States, there's a lot of evidence um, to promote addressing um, housing insecurity first, um, and that that then improves other um, social risk factors. However, um, it all is based on people's individual social needs. And so if housing, you know, they're sleeping on someone's couch, then um, they may not need housing specifically in that moment. They may need food or transportation more. Um, we were also talking about specific recommendations for integrating social risk factor um, care into universal health coverage. Um, and so the most important first step to doing that is um, getting policymakers and decision makers interested in doing that. Um, because if they're not interested, then there will be little community engagement and therefore effectiveness of those programs. Um, and so trying to, uh, to discuss <laughs> how to get decision makers and policy makers more interested um, in community engagement um, and in integration of social risk factors and universal health coverage is key to making that happen. Um, and we discussed kind of, uh, what ACEs um, or adverse childhood events are most important to address 
And that one, there is no specific data or research to say that one is more important. Um, but of course, remembering that this is from the lens of a child. Um, so anything that affects a child directly or that affects the parent's ability to care for that child um, is, is something to focus on. Um, and of course, trying to improve all of them as best as possible, <laughs> um, which is very hard. So um, those are some of the, the questions we discussed in our room. Um, and thank you everyone for the participation. Uh, thank you so much, Gabriela, for the wonderful discussion that you have done and facilitated on all the talk and all the contribution that, that you have done for the webinar. I uh, loved your talk also. Uh, moving on to room four, I think it was Gobit. No, it was, I think it was us, myself, Sankha, and Nick, and uh, Medina. I think all of us were in room four, if I'm not wrong. Yes, right? Yes, yes, we were in room four. Okay. So, Marina, do you want to go ahead um, uh, regarding what we talked about? Yes. Uh, first of all, we didn't have uh, much time, but as we discussed, we discussed that uh, uh, the people uh, of, uh, my, uh, of some ethnic groups and minorities living in some countries, even that they have the access, the full access to health care, they do not use it because they do not know their rights properly. So we need to communicate with the leaders of those minorities to get them know what they have and how to improve uh, their health. And uh, what we also started to discuss was the trust that we need to gain with the, those ethnic groups in order to improve their health. Yeah, if I add something, uh, it's all about uh, how social determinants of health would uh, affect uh, health outcomes. I mean, even you have total access to health and health equity, uh, and there are no discrimination, still there would be problems if the other factors have problems, so like education, just as Marina taught correctly. Yes. Okay. Yeah, is that uh, yeah. So were there any other rooms or I think we were done with room four rooms, I guess, because I think a couple of participants had kind of exited the meeting before we- Yes, go. actually that they, we have closed down the fifth and fourth to sixth because there's no participant. I was there only in the fifth, uh, but anyway, uh, I think only four has discussed that. I think we had a great discussion even we had listened to that from the all four. Uh, so what do you line up? Okay, I think let's move on with the five ones. So I think we are about to end the session to, for today. Um, and it was a wonderful connecting with the SIG on health equity, wonderful connecting with Kim and um, everybody who is associated with that uh, special interest group of health equity. I think that was, um, it was a wonderful, wonderful session. And I'm sure all the participants who have attended the session today, they must have had a good time and they must have um, benefited with all the conversations and all the talks that the speakers have uh, given. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Gabriella, Dr. Marina Nicholson, Dr. Marina um, Ivanovich, Gobit, and um, uh, uh, Hanin, Hanin, yeah. So all of them for contributing and agreeing to uh, do such wonderful um, talks uh, which have benefited the speakers, uh, which have benefited the particip participants for today. So I would like, if I can't see Kim, if she's anywhere, she could say a few words. Before I am here. Finish. I am here. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. I I'm just couldn't here. see. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let me just. Yeah. Add yeah. If you know, so I can take a good picture of all of us. Sure. That sounds good. And I did want to let everyone know that um, those QR codes that you see there are for different projects that the special interest group in health equity is doing. Um, we will also be reviewing those at the Wonka Europe meeting in Brussels. Dr. Viviana Martinez Bianchi, who you can see right there, wave Vivi. Um, she will be representing and hosting that meeting. So if you will be at the Wonka Europe meeting, please do join her at that meeting. And if you'd like to actually um, be a part of it, um, please do scan those QR codes, which Zainab, if you could go back to those QR yeah, codes, sure. that would be great. 
Um, they are three separate ones, and uh, we will be sharing this information too in the YDM groups um, so that you can have this available to you. The first one is just the link, which you can find on the Wonka website. If you just Google how to join the SIG on health equity, um, you can join there or scan the QR code. The second one is a more um, in-depth interest form that will let us know your interests in health equity. And then the last one is actually doing health equity impact assessments and a survey that we are doing for that. Um, we'd love to get more involvement from all of our YDMs and all our Wonka members throughout the world. And um, I am excited that hopefully we will see you in Brussels or in Sydney. And I'm going to pass this back to Zainab. Okay, thank you, Kim. Thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you, everyone. And thank you, especially uh, our translators, Cheryl and Anna, for doing a wonderful job. Uh, for doing a wonderful job. Thank you so much. Um, so I was, so we are about to end. So I was just saying if you could have a nice picture of all of us, it would be a good remembrance. Let me just stop the share and so that we can have a good picture. So, and there are a couple of people who haven't turned on their cameras, but that's fine. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Guys, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you.